Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. We know the Bible can be hard to understand and complicated to sort out all the different uh, issues and questions that you may have as you're reading it for yourself and trying to interpret it. So what we're wanting to do in this series is just to provide some background information, some context, and some helpful resources for you to interpret the Bible. So here's what we want you to know before you read. Nahum is considered one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. It is included in the Twelve, a collection of prophetic writings combined into one work in the Hebrew Bible and grouped with the Nevi'im, or prophets. The first verse of the book states that it is the Oracle of Nineveh. It's a prophetic statement against the nation of Assyria, and more specifically against their capital city of Nineveh. Now, the book is notable for its literary quality, which may not always come across in translation. It's written in technically sophisticated poetic form, and it includes an opening hymn featuring a theophany of the divine warrior. This section contains a partial acrostic, a literary device where each line starts with the next letter in the alphabet. Now, the acrostic in Nahum 1 is incomplete. The Hebrew equivalent of the letter D is missing for some unclear reason, maybe just a textual error. Scholars have discussed this acrostic at, gr at great length to try and understand what the literary device is communicating. Acrostics are used in a number of places in the Old Testament, such as Lamentations 1, Psalm 119, and elsewhere. They can be used to show literary skill or to help in memorization, but also to show a sense of completeness. Now, this makes the half acrostic in Nahum all the more vexing. It is possible that it's being used to show a sense of incompleteness or anticipation for what's foretold in the rest of the book. The partial acrostic in Nahum 1 is followed by a series of taunts, insults, and so-called woe oracles. These are targeted at Assyria in particular ways. The taunts make use of lion imagery, which we know played a large role in Assyrian royal ideology. The insults compare Assyria's soldiers to women, which has its roots in treaty curses. The book ends with what can be called a dirge, comparable to what may be heard at a funeral, but in this case it's for the city of Nineveh. This dirge is not one with a somber and compassionate note, but one of joy and relief as the Israelites' enemy has been decimated. Nahum, along with prophets like Obadiah, consists of several oracles against nations, which some scholars identify as so-called performative utterances. Now, that is, these oracles didn't just have literary and poetic value, but also a functional purpose in the act of saying them. As we've discussed in another video, a study on the language at Ugarit has reasonably shown that divine performative language was understood as self-enacting in a way that human and subdivine performative language isn't. To speak the oracle was to set it in motion. Now, while Ugaritic literature and Hebrew literature, especially Nahum, are far removed chronologically, this comparison can still provide some important context for reading these kinds of performative oracles. Nahum even contains examples of multiple genres of these performative oracles, with things like mock funeral laments and taunt songs. Going back to the opening of the book, verse 1 continues, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. Now, this is all that we have to go on for the author and their context. The author's name is given as Nahum, a name which means something like compassion. We don't have any patronymic identification, only a place of origin, Elkosh. There's no widespread agreement on where Elkosh is. The early church father Jerome suggested it was a site in Israel, perhaps the modern site El Kazeh, or even Capernaum, and the name Capernaum has been suggested to mean Nahum's city. Some late sources have suggested Elkosh is in Judah, but this is probably unlikely. Other later sources have identified Elkosh as a site in what is now northern Iraq, like the site Al Kush, which is about 50 miles north of Mosul. This site is just across the Tigris from the modern archaeological site of Kuyunik, which is identified as ancient Nineveh. If this is the case, then the prophet was an exile from the northern kingdom who wrote in Assyria, in the shadow of its capital, and then sent his prophecy back to Judah. 
the text appears to have been in written form from the beginning. It does not seem to have any indicators of oral transmission before it was written down. It was composed as a written work. Now this is clear both from the sophisticated nature of the writing, like the acrostic that we mentioned earlier, but also more simply in that the, in the first verse it's called the Book of Nahum. Now this means the text almost certainly dates to the lifetime of Nahum, but as we said, we don't know much about the prophet. From clues in the book, we can get a rough time frame during which the book was written, between 664 or 663 BC and 612 or shortly thereafter. If one allows for actual predictive prophecy, the book would date to some time before 612 when the city of Nineveh was destroyed. And if you don't believe in such things, you would date it to shortly after 612. The text gives us plenty of context clues about what was happening in the world when it was written, and when we add what we know from history and archaeology, we find a lot of helpful information for understanding the text. In the text itself, we see in chapter 1, verse 12, that the Assyrian Empire was considered strong, even at full strength. Now, this can be seen as the time before the Assyrian Empire went into decline. We also see in 3.8 that Nineveh is compared to a city called Noamon, which is the city of Thebes. Now, the city of Thebes was considered impregnable until the Assyrians conquered it in either 664 or 663. Uh, this places Nahum in the latter half of the 7th century, when the Assyrians reached the height of their power. The Assyrian king Esarhaddon, the son of Sennacherib, who fought the Judahite king Hezekiah, fought the Egyptian pharaoh Taharqa, who escaped the Assyrian forces to his native land of Cush. When Esarhaddon took Egypt, he did not fully subdue it, and Taharqa rebelled, forcing Esarhaddon's son Ashurbanipal to fight the Egyptians. Now, this campaign in 667 resulted in the destruction of the city of Thebes in 664 or 663. Now, this relief is a depiction of a siege during that campaign, but it's likely the city of Memphis. No, not that Memphis. Yeah, yeah, that one. It shows the Assyrian forces attacking the city in the top register, then leading away captives along the Nile in the lower two registers. The Assyrian Empire was at its height after the conquest of Egypt was secured. Ashurbanipal built up the city of Nineveh, including a massive library, and brought loot and captives from his many campaigns back to the city, making it the largest in the world at the time. However, Ashurbanipal also dealt with rebellions and conflicts, particularly from Babylon and their allies like Elam. The last known year of his reign is 631. In this year, he presumably died or was deposed, and the throne passed to his son. The end of Ashurbanipal's reign is actually a bit of a mystery. From 631 to 612, it's a confusing period in Assyrian history because we don't have good records. It seems the Assyrians had a series of ineffectual kings who couldn't handle the rebellions and assertive vassals, namely Babylon. The Babylonians allied with the Medes, a tribal confederation of Iranian peoples, and in 612 the Medes destroyed Nineveh. Later sources describe how the Medes diverted the Tigris and flooded the city. Archaeological excavations of the city show that it was destroyed, and skeletal remains were found unburied, meaning that no one returned to care for the dead after its destruction. While the Medes took the city, they did not seem to maintain it, and the territory passed to the control of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Now, when you date the composition of Nahum depends on whether you allow for predictive prophetic visions. If you do, then you may consider Nahum to have been written after the fall of Thebes in 664 or 63, during the reign of Ashurbanipal, but before his death when the Assyrian Empire began its precipitous decline. Now, this would mean that Nahum predicted Assyria's downfall well before it began, when the empire was at its peak. However, if you do not believe in predictive prophetic visions, then you would probably consider the text to have been written sometime after Ashurbanipal's death, most likely during the Neo-Babylonian period, maybe during the reign of their first or second kings, Nabopolassar or Nebuchadnezzar II. Now, whatever your stance, we do know that the events Nahum writes about did come to pass, and that places its composition within a specific time period that we can identify and which archaeologists and historians know well. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any upcoming videos. If you learned something new today, be sure to take a minute and share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.